Um, issues have been a couple. People have thought that the large vessel involvement looks similar in the two diseases and have wondered why there's this difference in older patients getting one set of diseases, including the uh, symptoms in the head, the cranial symptoms, which aren't common in Takayasu's. People who have done studies looking at the pathology, taking biopsy specimens and looking at them under the microscope, have shown that what's going on in the blood vessels in Takayasu's and giant cell arteritis is very similar and it's made people wonder, are they really the same disease? This study looked at the uh, imaging studies that had been performed, so looking at the angiograms. In the past, these might have been angiograms done with a catheter and dye injected into an artery. All of these were done using MR angiograms, magnetic resonance angiograms that don't take the uh, catheter being put into an artery. The, uh, in, there were a couple of interesting things that were found. First, there was a lot of similarity, and that's not surprising because we've known that it's the large vessels that are involved. But specifically, this study looked at the patterns of involvement, at comparing if the subclavian artery on one side is involved, is it on the other side? And in giant cell arteritis, it was very similar in those arteries. And in fact, for most of the arteries on the right and left side of the body, they were very similar. What the main difference was with the patients, or in the patients with Takayasu's arteritis, where there was a definite difference between involvement of the left subclavian and the right subclavian, um, that there was much more asymmetry in those patients. Um, but overall, there, was, um, there were many similarities in the two groups. That this study has a lot, a lot of potential impact on developing um, ways of looking at patients with these diseases. We have um, what are called classification criteria for the disorders. These classification criteria were put together for people doing studies to try to differentiate one kind of vasculitis from another. Um, and they weren't used specifically for diagnosis. One of the aims in the future is to develop diagnostic criteria. So having a set of criteria to give people fairly good assurance that they can make a specific diagnosis. Now one of the questions of this is, does it matter? Are these really the same disease and just that it shows up or it looks different in younger people than it does in older people who get it? And that we don't know, but I think it will change how we understand the diseases. The, um, giant cell arteritis, it has typically been recognized because of its cranial symptoms and we know that there are a good number of people who have large vessel involvement and you may not know it unless you go looking for it. The other is that often patients with Takayasu's arteritis are missed and they may not have any symptoms and a, a, a almost classic story is to hear of somebody who's identified only because they went for a routine visit a routine medical visit and maybe it was even going to their dentist and finding that blood pressure couldn't be found in one arm that they had no symptoms uh, until that um, absent pulse was identified but of forms of, of uh, vasculitis, giant cell arteritis is one of the uh, more common forms. Um, it has a, we tend to see a lot of it in Minnesota because it has a higher incidence in um, people of northern European extraction. Um, so it's seen in, in northern Europe, it's seen uh, frequently in Minnesotans. <laughs>